Spanning more than 2,000 miles, the awesome power of the Mississippi River is often masked by its beauty. But in the summer of 1993, the river turned ugly. From Minnesota to Cairo, Old Man River spilled over its banks, creating havoc for thousands of people. Early in the year, heavy rains caused flooding and several minor problems in a few places along the river. But by June, it was apparent that the Mississippi was on a rampage. Water was creeping into cities and towns, and acres of farmland were underwater. In July, sandbag operations were in full swing up and down the Mississippi. The race against Old Man River was on. It was a summer unlike any other. Normally, peaceful river towns were engaged in a war with the flood. Local residents, aided by volunteers and military units, worked round the clock in some cases to create levees they hoped would hold up against the rising river. In the water. People battling the river never gave up. Sandbagging became a full-time occupation for some. Others from around the country who heard about the flood traveled to the heartland, volunteering to help wherever they were needed. The drive and determination of these people was quite evident. If not for their efforts, the flood of 93 would surely have been even more devastating. For those stricken by the flood, numerous relief organizations were standing by to help. Juice That's good. or water, what would you like? The Salvation Army and Red Cross provided hundreds of victims with emergency shelter, clothing, and food. Boy, how high do you figure that is? That's two and a half, three feet deep in there. Mm. People said it would take many months, even years, to completely recover from the flood. Indeed, cleaning up was no small task. And even though many of the physical scars were repaired in short order, the mental anguish will linger for some time. The damage caused by the flood was quite prominent during the summer of 93, but it was the never-say-quit attitude of the people battling the river that stood out from the destruction. I've beat a lot of things in my life. I can beat this. I'm not going to give up until I have to. It's an attitude found throughout the heartland. Neighbor helping neighbor during the Great Flood of 93. St. Genevieve, a town of about 4,500, located at the northernmost part of this Mississippi Valley region. One of the oldest towns west of the Mississippi, many structures in St. Genevieve date back to the 1700s. Although historic, one important element lacking in St. Gen's history was the construction of a protective flood wall. So when the river began to rise, it threatened St. Genevieve early and fast. Well, we've had seven floods that we had to sandbag, but uh, this is the first time that it's ever threatened to really get in the store. The 45 foot of each on top of these windows. So we're just going to let the water come in if it comes in. We've issued an evacuation order for those parts of town that lie within the 500 year floodplain. The two or three buildings in the back were all plumbing goods, but uh, we've got it all moved out. It wants to butt up against the, the hills again and claim the land that it had years and years back. So it's telling us to get out of its way. It's taken back what we've used all these years. The push was on to save St. Genevieve and its French colonial heritage. kind of a hopeless situation almost, I guess you could say. 
feels kind of, you feel helpless. I mean, a lot of people are putting a lot of effort into trying to save the town, and I hope, hope it works. Eagle. Nearly everyone in town pitched in to fill sandbags. I didn't really want the flood to come, but it came, so I guess I'm trying to help out as all I can. Gotta fight until we're done. You can just stay until they tell us to get out. And almost immediately, local residents were joined by hundreds from around the country who had heard about St. Genevieve's fight. It's horrible. I just felt that I needed to be here and to help people out. I feel better by being here than at work right now. And we thought that we would like to help and fill some sandbags because it's just we're in Memphis doing our own thing, but, you know, so many people are suffering here that we wanted to just come help. We had about uh, 250 people who showed up, and, and they worked real teamwork. I, I was given a report that they, everybody just pitched in. There was no sitting around and shooting a breeze or anything. They went to work, and they just, they saved this, the north end. As the scope of the impending crisis became clear, National Guard troops were dispatched to assist and organize the exhaustive sandbagging effort. You gotta listen to that civilian counterpart because they've been fighting us since 1735. We, we came here on Wednesday. You know, the river's the bear, and every now and then you get a little rat runs up your leg, and you gotta address that rat. But you gotta keep in the back of your mind, the rat works for the bear. He's a subcontractor for the bear, so you gotta deal with that rat, but you don't wanna spike up on something and, and use all your resources, mm -hmm. and then everybody burn out. Together, National Guard members and volunteers were able to construct a huge sandbag levee that spanned nearly the length of the entire town. Often, workers struggle to keep the levee literally inches above the rising river. If this levee would fail right now, it would be over our heads. We'd be swimming. We'd have to swim. I don't know. It seems like people's spirits, they, they stay up better than you think they would. I won't ever forget this, I believe. I was old enough to remember 73, but I just don't think I'll ever forget this one. Tired and wishing it was all over with more than anything. Tired, yeah, 12 hours, 16 hours a day. I know we were working here, working all day, and then we'd work till about 11 o'clock at night. Then you go home and you can't sleep, and you lay in bed thinking about what could happen, and get to sleep about 1 in the morning, and get up about 6 and do it again. Before it was over, a number of homes and businesses were flooded, but most agreed the volunteer effort paid off. The floodwater won a few battles, but the spirit of the sandbaggers won the war. Come on, come on with them. And despite considerable material damage, most residents around St. Genevieve came away with a renewed sense of pride for their community. Several miles downriver from St. Genevieve lies Kaskaskia Island, part of Randolph County in Illinois. Kaskaskia is no stranger to flooding. In 1973, when the Mississippi River overflowed, the island was devastated. Many of those flooded out never returned. Something happens and you can do no more. You quit. You have to. You have no choice. That was yesterday. Now you pick up and you go on from today. Twenty years later, the residents who did move back found themselves, once again, surrounded by trouble. Years of threatening floods had toughened the residents of Kaskaskia, but the record water levels during the summer of 93 soon proved too much for the levee protecting the island. 
one side of it collapsed and they attempted to repair it and it was out of control. Old Man River is coming in. When the levee finally gave way, some Kaskaskia residents could only watch in shock at the flowing nightmare that would ravage their property. We looked back, we seen a big wall of water, you know, going up over the top of the levee, and it's, uh, it's, I guess, like a massive Niagara Falls. Some of them were so scared that they didn't let them even have time to put on a pair of shoes. Some managed to load up what they could and escape just ahead of the water on hastily constructed roads. The water came so fast that those who delayed their escape eventually had to be evacuated by ferry. <laughs> Residents of the island were concerned about pets and livestock left behind in their haste to evacuate when the levee broke. Right now, as you can obviously see, there's no human life over there. However, there's a large amount of livestock still over there that needs to come off. Uh, cattle, uh, we've got livestock on the levees. We have to make sure they're cared for and there's no problems. Some animals found refuge on their own, and much of the livestock rescued was an attempt to recover an investment. Many, many homes and farm buildings were destroyed on Kaskaskia when the levee broke. In fact, one report stated that of the 60 or so homes on the island, only five were left standing. As with many small towns in the Midwest, Kaskaskia is proud of its past. It was home to the first state capital of Illinois. It's also the home to the Immaculate Conception Church, located in the state's oldest parish dating back to 1675. But the flood of 93 was not impressed with heartland history. As the river eventually began to recede, it was evident by the discoloration on the church just how high the water rose. And inside, devastation. Indeed, the Great Flood of 93 was not kind to the island of Kaskaskia. And the residents, unsure of their future, could only watch and wait for the water to go away. In addition to the towns of St. Genevieve and Kaskaskia, people in the northern heartland counties of Perry in Missouri and Randolph and Jackson in Illinois were heavily affected by the flooding. One of the most significant features of the historic water levels for this area was the closing of the Mississippi River Bridge at Chester. Yeah, they can't keep the water from getting on it because they don't want to sandbag it because that would be putting too much weight on the bridge. The Highway 51 bridge at Chester is the only means to cross the river for miles in either direction. So it wasn't long before motorists realized what the closing would mean. You can definitely know what that would be. You got to go to Cape, you got to go to St. Louis. Just that simple. For weeks, thousands of travelers and workers were forced to drive nearly 100 miles out of their way just to get a short distance across the swollen river. It'll be quite a while. It's been it's a major inconvenience on people that, that still have a job on both sides of the river, and, and it'll be a long time before we can get back to normal. Route 3, another important transportation artery, also had to be closed near Rockwood, further crippling an already wounded area. Chester is also home to the Menard Correctional Center, the oldest prison in Illinois, and home to numerous death row inmates. Water quickly flooded parts of the prison. The situation had to be monitored round the clock. We do have relocation plans on the board and ready to go. Uh, the inmates have been made aware of those relocation plans, so there won't be any, uh, any surprises to the inmates. That's obviously our last resort. We simply don't want to do that unless we have to. Sandbags and pumps were used to help fight the flood, and although some inmates had to be relocated inside Menard, the prison was not evacuated. 
The same cannot be said for many of the small towns along the river bottoms in Randolph and Jackson counties. I think when you're younger, you could stand a whole lot more than you can. When you, when you pass that 50 mark, you begin to hurt, you know, as, as far as uh, what you put into it. And, and uh, it, it's just tough. It's just tough. Residents were concerned about the condition of their levees. The levee's safe right now. But seven days from now, what is it going to be? You're never safe until it gets the rivers plumbed down. You know, it's always a chance it can still break. In Jacob, this church evacuation is just one example of daily efforts by residents trying to salvage what they could. Residents of Grand Tower were optimistic their levee could hold but worried it might not be high enough. This one right here is well above average, and I believe it holds anything that is going to come down to us. Sandbags were used to raise the levee, but fortunately, the extra height was not needed. Residents of Rockwood hoped to save their post office along with this small store, but the river was determined, and the store was lost. It's too late to do a lot of stuff down here. There's just other than stand by each other and help each other get in and out. Many Rockwood residents headed for higher ground, but others seemed to silently challenge the river to drive them out. And still others decided to go head-to-head -head with the flood, using anything they could get their hands on to help. I was about to my ends wet yesterday, but my wife, she's been staying up night, and I take the day shift, and she's in there sleeping now, and I got two boys that's been helping with it, so they've been doing real good. Our uh, well is underwater. Our septic tank is uh, underwater. Our bathroom's not flushing. Water supplies throughout the region were unsafe. Many people relied on water brought in by relief agencies. Many of those out of their homes were put out of work as well. Businesses in the floodplain were forced to shut down. And uh, we're cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to hold out. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of strain uh, with the river here, but uh, we, uh, we'd like to hope we can win the battle. Sandbags and pumps were used to keep water out, but most efforts proved futile. On the other side of the river in Perry County, Missouri, many of the residents in the Boyce Brule Bottoms area had left their homes before the levee protecting the area gave way. So we know it's coming. Just make the best out of what we can here. It, uh, it's been a long time we've been working against it, but yeah, I guess it's gonna come in anyway. Thousands of acres of farmland flooded. By 11.30, 12 o'clock, it had reached Highway 51. Water that poured through the breach contributed to the problems with the Chester Bridge. And as with the Illinois side, several businesses in Perry County were forced to shut down operations. As with Kaskaskia, a major concern, the livestock left behind with the levee broke. And they'll swim for a while, then they'll get on a little piece of, you know, vine or something in a tree, and then they'll just get their strength back, then they'll swim some more, and, and you know, some of them make it to the bank, some of them don't. It took heroic efforts to rescue some of the drowning animals who would desperately try to gain ground on anything solid. Some animals were lucky. You don't gotta swim no more. They were rescued or found their way to the levee. Others were not so fortunate. Hit especially hard during the flood of 93 was the town of Evansville on the Kaskaskia River in Randolph County. Evansville was caught somewhat by surprise because it's located nearly 10 miles inland. The Kaskaskia, which normally flows into the Mississippi, backed up into unprotected city streets and homes. It's a lot higher than for, uh, 73, because it was three inches in my shop in 73, and there's about 33 inches in there right now. 
Of major concern was the town's water plant. We are at about a water depth right here, We're about nine feet. Ten feet there, about 12 feet around the corner in this area. Straight down here, if the person was standing here, you wouldn't even be able to see the top of their head. The most important thing in town is that you got to keep the water running, not only for uh, the, the residents, but for fire protection. You know, you got to have water. You know, everybody needs to drink water. In an effort to save the water supply, the city, volunteers, and the National Guard worked together to install pumps and construct a temporary sandbag levee. And although a boil water order was issued as a precaution, the water plant was able to maintain operation. One of the most controversial issues during the summer of 93 was the decision to intentionally breach the levee just north of Prairie de Rocher in northern Randolph County. I basically felt we didn't have any choice. If we, if we just stand back, we just have to hope and pray that it doesn't cross the levee. And by breaching it here, we're trying to open up a channel and we're hoping that water takes the least resistant path out. We need to save the town. We need to, we need to save whatever we can, but sometimes, you know, you have to sacrifice things for others. In theory, the control breach would relieve pressure on the levee, improving the odds for the town. There was some uncertainty, and property owners in the affected area protested the move. The section we breached, the, or the core breached the levee in, would have been underwater by tonight anyway. It, it made no difference. What we did was the core flooded it so that it would flow backwards toward it to slow it down so that we had a buffer between us and the levee. Although thousands of acres of farmland flooded, the strategy worked. Prairie de Rocher was spared. For this area, the flood of 93 will have lasting effects. It's standing straight, as most of the older houses are. There's people down here that maybe didn't even talk to each other before. So it may have a good side as far as that goes. Uh, everybody pulling together. But while many people suffered, it was not hard to find that heartland attitude so common during the summer. We're going to move back because we've been here 47 years. This is our home. We're going to stay here. Just south of Jackson County in Illinois is Union County. The towns of Wolf Lake and Ware escaped the flooding that occurred to the north and south. Residents there were protected by a solid levee. Post one, I'll go over this real quickly, Walker Blackwell. Post two, Thompson. Post three, Hines, McClellan. Post four, there was concern about traffic on and around sensitive levee areas. Any questions? If not, go to your truck. The National Guard from posts in both Wolf Lake and Ware help patrol the levees and discourage sightseers. People are curious. Curious kill, you know how the old saying goes, curiosity killed the cat. As the flood of 93 continued south, it pushed river levels in Cape Girardeau County to all-time highs. Fortunately for much of Cape Girardeau, a massive concrete flood wall constructed in the late 1950s protects the downtown area. There have been a number of calls about the wall, and uh, people hear of levees breaking, so they wonder about a concrete wall. I can't help but think if we didn't have the wall, where the water would be, and it would be all over this whole area. But it was a much different story on the north and south ends of the city. On the north side lies what's known as the Red Star neighborhood. South of the city is what used to be called Smelterville. Neither area is a stranger to flooding. And uh, of course, I hope, I hope it doesn't go down too fast because I'm, I'm like the old timers. I believe if it goes down too fast, it'll creep back up. And if it goes down slow, it's gone. We're done for the year. Many residents were forced to evacuate. Well, we lived in the house on the corner of Third Street and Water Street, and the water came up. And we ran for a week looking for a house, you know, Chappie and Fruitland and everywhere. There weren't any empty. So we moved in this one here, and a week or so later, the water started coming up here. And you're renting here? <laughs> yeah, we're renting here. But rather than move, we just sandbagged and got pumps. Flood relief shelters were set up at various locations to house those driven from their homes. Don't know how long I'll be here. 
My daughter, she's she's liking it better. It's the first time she's she went to sleep for the first time. Most of the times so it just happened. She's been crying. I'm kind of like uh, afraid that I'm gonna drown in the water, and it's like. I'm afraid that my pets are going to drown because they're not there. The people here are great. They've been really nice and as helpful as possible, you know, and, but it's not home. And that's what we need. We need to be home. Some determined residents use sandbags to help protect their houses. Went out in the boat and looking at the rest of the houses down the road and come back and the levee had busted and pulled up here and started loading sandbags. We just hanging on until to see what the water is going to do. If the water don't crash, then we're going to have to move out of here. On the north side, members of the Red Star Baptist Church, with the help of volunteers, use sandbags to prevent damage to the church building. All right, where do you guys want me? Local Red Cross efforts proved invaluable to residents who were determined to stay put during the flood. Would you like some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and cold cuts? I know y'all probably didn't okay, but Red they want to make sure everybody's okay. Is it Evie? <laughs> He's just getting me. Like, let me get you some sandwiches. The other guys go out fishing. No, my son's been good. So you guys making fish. it? Let me just go ahead and take the whole package if you want to. They're no. mostly peanut butter and jelly. You can have the whole box. Just north of Cape Girardeau in Jackson, residents from all over the area took part in what was called Sandbag Central. They'll be on call, so to speak, for anybody that has an uh, emergency. We'll have a tractor trailer rig that we can haul them to in a very short time period. It was a supply shop and distribution point for sandbags that were taken wherever needed. To accommodate working volunteers and avoid midday heat, the operation went well into the night. Common to many flooded towns along the river were concerns about germs and disease. Flooding affected operations of several municipal sewage treatment plants, resulting in raw sewage being released directly into the river. With nothing to prevent untreated sewage from backing up into the floodwater, hundreds of residents and flood control workers were threatened. Any cut or scrape could mean serious infection. I scratched my foot and I thought maybe I better come and see about getting a tetanus shot. Better safe than sorry. You're gonna feel a stick. As a result, clinics offering tetanus shots were common throughout the heartland. Often, medical personnel would travel into the field to administer the free shots. We realized that people weren't able to leave the sandbag area, so we decided to bring the tetanus shots out to the people. Another concern for Cape Girardeau was the location of an electric substation that helped supply power to the city. Union Electric officials were confident that an alternate plan to provide power was in place should problems occur. But at one point, floodwater affected the substation, causing much of the city to be without power for several hours. We had in our switching station south of town, water broke through uh, a conduit uh, tray that was there that uh, involved in our sandbagging, but somehow it broke through there and uh, water got up into our relays in our uh, switching station control house. As one of the worst disasters in the history of the United States, the Great Flood of 93 did receive its share of national attention. News media from all over came to the area to see firsthand the terrible destruction. Joining us now live from the flood wall in Cape Girardeau is Harry Smith, co-anchor of CBS This Morning. Harry, thanks for being here. Mike, how you doing? Making a special stop in the heartland was CBS News anchor Harry Smith. A Midwest native, Harry shared some thoughts about the tragedy. You have been traveling up and down the river. What are some of your more vivid memories? It is amazing to me the, uh, the capacity of the people we have met in Iowa, in Missouri, and in Illinois who are fighting this river with every ounce of energy they have. This is a, this is a powerful, uh, humbling, natural thing, but the power of the people that are trying to fight this thing is, uh, is really inspiring. What's it like for you, Harry, covering this story? Is it hard? Well, it is, in some ways it is, in some ways it's not. It's good to be home. I uh, went to college and I grew up in, uh, in uh, just south of Chicago. I worked on, on farms through most of the time I was in high school and, and college. So it's, it's good to be home. At the same time, there's so much pain out here. 
God, people are getting hurt by this thing. And uh, in, in one sense, it makes you proud to be from this part of the country because you see the people you know working so hard, but at the same time, this thing is just hurting so many folks and it's, it's not done yet. Just southwest of Cape Girardeau are Dutchtown and Allenville. Like Evansville to the north, these small towns lie several miles inland from the river. But the tremendous amount of water in the Mississippi caused the nearby diversion channel to become a serious threat. This wall, we start off three wide and, and it goes up to uh, about three feet. And uh, after that, we try to shim it up in the back and it'll go up to five feet high at least. Uh, we're standing in the lowest point right now and you can see that uh, in the next two days, the water's going to be on the pavement here. Residents launched a massive sandbag effort along Highway 74 to save the town. At first, they wanted 100 loads, and then they needed 200, needed another 100 loads. So we've we got over 200 loads of sand up here for them to sandbag, and they, they've been doing a lot of work. <laughs> really tired, but you just got to keep on. <laughs> National Guard and volunteers pitched in to construct this huge temporary levee. I called the Salvation Army this morning and said, have you got anything for little old ladies to do? And they said, well, we need baggers and tires, so I'm out here. That's really the only reason he's out here to help. We're both school teachers and uh, they need us out here. That's why we're here. The effort and hard work paid off most of the Dutchtown area was spared. The town of Allenville literally became an island surrounded by flood water. It's been 20 years since we've had the boat in and out of here like this, 1973. At first, large trucks were used to move residents in and out of town. As flood water continued to rise, access to the town became more of a problem. Made it to the city limits, but we can't get under the bridge to get actually up in there. So now we're going to try going around and see if we can find another way into the town. Drinking water became a major concern as most wells were contaminated. The Red Cross and Coast Guard were called in to deliver supplies of fresh water. As with all areas along the river, the spirit of Cape Girardeau County residents remained high. But fluctuating crest predictions, mounting stress, and the intense midsummer heat did begin to take a toll. Most disasters happen anywhere from a minute to an hour. Usually an hour is the most. And it's over with. And then you pick up your pieces what you've lost. But this is like a silent monster. It comes, it bites, and it draws back. I don't know how much longer we can withstand all this mentally and physically, watching it and just being here with it all the time. How hard has it been? It's been very, very hard. Continuing south, the flood of 93 took on Alexander County in Illinois and Scott County in Missouri. Just across the river from Cape Girardeau are the villages of McClure and East Cape Girardeau, both in northern Alexander County, and neither more than several hundred yards from the threatened levee. We have an escape plan in East Cape, and uh, we just hope for the best. We either go that way or that way, or keep your fingers crossed. It's going to be fine. It is. It's going to be all right. The Corps of Engineers felt this particular levee would hold up against the predicted crest but most residents weren't taking any chances. Because I'm not sure the levee's gonna hold. And I have uh, six kids and I have to get, you know, things out, and especially things that we care a lot about. I've taken a lot of things to my mom's over the past week. Most of the families with children are moving out today. And most of us, well, a lot of us have already moved out. So, <laughs> you know, it's gonna be pretty empty. It's gonna be pretty scary, but hopefully pretty soon we can get back. And then they rebuilt, it started in 1950 and built 51, 52, and 53 and finished it. And it pulled the whole 50 foot. But I'll guarantee you, I don't want to be behind it, 50 foot. <laughs> All right. 
Seep water from under the levee caused travel problems as Highway 146 crossing the bridge to Missouri and Route 3 south of McClure both took on water. We're putting in a grade raise here to keep the highway above the seep water. They needed to build it up a long time ago. Even the water lower than this is underwater. That's better than going through water. I'd rather do this than go through the water. Despite all efforts, Route 3 South, the main highway to Cairo, was completely closed for weeks. The Corps' confidence that the levee would hold proved correct. However, seawater continued to be a troublemaker. This is probably uh, just as critical as when it was coming up, like it was. Uh, I wouldn't advise anybody to move back in yet because it's sure not over yet. Not out of the woods yet? No, not by a long shot yet. As river levels fell, seep water continued to rise, causing some residents to wonder when they'd ever get home. Just south of East Cape Girardeau, this homeowner in Thebes had a unique approach to life in a flood-prone area. I've been on the river all my life. I work on the river and barn on the river. I was slacking on the river. A house built on stilts is what many people in this area would have preferred. The Bible says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike, so we can't sit and, and say that, well, the Lord's going to put a wall around us and the water's going to go on. We have to, have to be prepared to take it along with everyone else. Much of Thebes flooded, causing churches and homes to be evacuated. And I'm scared, and I'm going to get it out of here while I still can. And I just don't want to take any chances on losing. I've worked too hard to get it, and I just don't want to lose it. Across the river in Commerce, Missouri, residents who are no strangers to flooding watch the river rise 800 yards out of its banks. We just remodeled our bathroom and put a new floor down and everything, and they're talking that it's supposed to be in our house. We put in a lot of time rebuilding and trying to save what we had, and then when the water comes up and bursts through on you, well, it takes the wind out. <laughs> it's gonna get worse before it gets better, it looks like. The water at Commerce flooded city streets, homes, businesses, and farms. It's a bad situation. Like I said, I can move, but they can't move their crops. A new road had to be constructed to help with access in and out of town. This road will be a necessity when the crest comes, because that road will be impassable then. I'm sure of that. I'm thankful they're doing it so we can get in and out and take care of things like we need to take care of them. The National Guard was called in to set up checkpoints and restrict traffic to commerce residents only. Our main mission is to check personnel coming in to the area, make sure that they do live here. Commerce had seen its share of floods, but none, they said, like the flood of 93. We'll just have to do what the good Lord it's him putting the water out, I guess. <laughs> and he's the one who can stop it. South of Alexander County in Illinois and Scott County in Missouri, the Great Flood of 93, like a storm across the plains, played itself out. Several factors were responsible, but most agree the wider, deeper river bed from Cairo, Illinois south was a main reason. We've got uh, approximately one million cubic feet per second flow coming down the upper Mississippi. Uh, down the Ohio River, we only have like 115,000 cubic feet per second. The capacity of the channel downstream of the confluence is between 1.2 and 1.5 million cubic feet per second. But the southernmost area of the heartland affected by the flood of 93 wasn't the last to feel the river's wrath. This is a Heartland News special report. 
Miller City residents are evacuating their homes at this hour. That because a levee has given way to the Mississippi River this afternoon. Water is pouring into Alexander County. This is what it looks like from the sky. A 100-foot section of the levee washed away by floodwaters. I mean, you can hear it roaring for about a half a mile away. Anybody south of Horseshoe Lake, evacuate immediately. 150 National Guard... Alexander County officials have been worried about a certain section of the levee which showed signs of weakness. When the Fayville levee blew near Miller City, it took everyone by surprise. Where we've been working was holding good. We never dreamt in a million years that this part of the levee would ever break out. It just, it's just taken us by storm. We just, just never dreamt that it would blow. Residents of Olive Branch, just a few miles east, knew the water was headed their way. Well, that's, you're talking a five-mile stretch of water running across the blacktop anywhere from four feet to a foot and a half deep. And I mean running. It's gushing. You can hear it. If you listen in the background, you can hear it. We got a lot more water in front of us than we thought we was going to have last night. I mean, we knew it was going to be there, but we didn't realize it was going to be this much this quick. No one in the Miller City Olive Branch area had much time to react. The DOT guy said the water was about a quarter to a half a mile just right behind me in the cornfield coming this way quick. Behind us in these flat fields, it's the water's leveling off. And now it's going to really start filling these ditches in, and we're going to get a lot of, lot of water in here in the next three or four hours. I look for us to get probably close to six feet of water in the next, by daylight. It was really surprising. It was a scary feeling, you know, because all this time we thought we were going to be safe here because we are kind of built on a little hump. But uh, we, were, we started to get worried, you know. The child was raising because the seepage was coming faster and the pumps was running more often, so... You could tell it was raising. You tell us what you want, and we'll do it. We've got 70 people. If you want me to split 35 over here and 35 down there and go that way. National Guard troops were quickly on the scene to sandbag and help save what they could. I've been watching it on the news, you know, on and off for, for the last week or so, and I just decided I'd try to come up and help some of these people. I knew if it was me, I'd want a little help. A lot of people is out of Kentucky and Missouri. Just stop by and help us a few hours and then go. A lot of them stays all day. Yeah. I'm tickled to death they come by and help us. Volunteers, along with inmates from surrounding prison camps, worked as fast as they could, but many residents were forced to flee their homes. It's eight or nine inches getting deeper. I just want to get over to my house and get a couple more items out. Others, determined, refused to give in, choosing to remain until the last moment. We're just going to keep sandbagging until, uh, until this river gets out of here. Yeah, we're just, uh, uh, every day it's a new problem, but uh, we just stay with it, you know. How much hope do you have at this point? Oh, we're going to hold it. We're going, we've got to. You don't go off and leave your home. Just don't move. And this is the only place I've ever lived, my whole married life. I've yeah, never is... changed address. I'm not going to give up until I have to. I'm probably right. Probably ride out in the boat. The destruction was swift and fierce. Then for us, that my shop has collapsed. Later, some residents were able to survey part of the damage. Everybody's tired and worn out. And now there's nothing you can do but try and move what you can and hope for the best. Move to high ground. But we'll be back. Bad feeling to see that water coming right down over your yard and everything, through your parking lot, under your building, house. Just something I never thought I'd ever see. Whenever you was a kid and you lost your little puppy, something like that, only it's you're growing up now and you're losing your life. You don't lose your life, but you lose what you're living for, a dream. And I guess that's all any of us have is dreams anymore. Nearly 70 feet of water covered what was once productive farmland near Dogtooth Bend in Alexander County. At the time, many feared this area would be forever lost to the river.
water, the common denominator during the summer of 93. I've seen this river for years and years, but I've never seen it like this before. This is the granddaddy of them all. But when water levels were at their highest, it still couldn't drown the spirit of the Heartland residents. Because after all the record levels and all the evacuation and destruction, the insufferable heat and the intolerable cleanup, what was left was really there all along. It was the spirit of people who have built not just houses and businesses, but homes and livelihoods in an area full of challenges. And it is meeting those challenges that makes us who we are. We are the people of the heartland. I'm Mike Shane, and this has been the Great Flood of 93. It's very hard to say how you feel right now, but it's, it's, it's a bad, bad day. When there, something happens and you can do no more, you quit. You have to. You have no choice. That was yesterday. Now you pick up and you go on from today. It was a mess the way it was when I left the bad this afternoon, and it's going to be terrible when I get back. It's the only thing I know of. Whenever you was a kid and you lost your little puppy, something like that. Only it's, you're growing up now and you're losing your life. You lose what you're living for, a dream. And I guess that's all any of us have is dreams anymore. It's just a bad feeling to see that water coming right down over your yard and everything, through your parking lot, under your building, house. Just something I never thought I'd ever see. Even the boxer, he, he gets in there and throws a good punch every now and then, but he doesn't always come out the victor. Men were fighting and everything else. That's just something nature. I mean, that's just something that nature did. And, and, uh, we can't stop it. There's a lot of things that happen that people can't stop. You'd like to stop it, but, but you can't stop it. 